see. Okay. okay. So I think now that it's five, I think we can get started now. So hello everyone, I'm Anakshi Savarikrama, and this is another edition of our Career Stock series hosted by the School of English. Um, so today we have Michael Groves with this talk. I'll do this for a year or two, how avoiding responsibility turned into a career in English language teaching. So Michael Groves is the director of the Center for Academic English Studies, Surrey International Institute, Dalian, China. And he's going to share with us with almost 30 years of experience teaching English as an additional or foreign language to adults across many countries. He'll also discuss the various qualifications available and the provisional uh, expectations involved. The talk will also look at teaching in three check, uh, sectors, namely language schools, the corporate world and the university sector. So a warm welcome to you, Michael. Um, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you and uh, thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, um, my job title is Director of Academic English Studies um, at a place called the Surrey International Institute, um, which is a little bit like a mini UNM. So it's it's in China, but it's one building. Um, it's not a whole campus. We can, we're hosted on another campus. Um, it sounds quite a, 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 a big title. I mean, in some ways, it is quite a, a, a big job. Um, and I want, what I want to talk to you today about is kind of how I got there and and my my career in English language teaching to adults um, and uh, teaching English for academic purposes. Um, before I start, this is not about teaching in the compulsory school sector. It's not about teaching English in secondary schools, in international schools, in private schools. This is about post compulsory English language teaching. Um, secondly, um, I'm very keenly aware that, that within the field of English language teaching, there is this native speaker, non native speaker debate. Um, it's important. Um, it's, it affects a lot of things, but I, I'm not really going to get into it today. Um, I will say that the career path I have taken, having grown up with this accent, uh, probably didn't hurt. Um, it means I can't make myself understood in the food court, but it probably helped me get jobs. Um, and the third thing, if you're here about how to get rich by teaching English, you're in the wrong place. Um, it is not a well paid profession overall, but um, at the same time, it, it's it's I've, I've I've never been sort of living under a bridge. OK, so I'm going to talk about three types of teaching. Um, private language schools, these are the kind of places where kids go off to school and uh, people go off to work. I'm going to talk about corporate training going into um, uh, companies and helping their staff develop their English language skills. And also what I do now, which is um, university language teaching or EAP, EAP meaning English for academic purposes. Okay. Um, so, oh, and the other thing is that I'm not using myself as a role model here. I'm not saying this is how you do it. Um, I'm this. I'm just going to talk about the experiences that I had and how my career progressed. And it started off with me looking like that um, when I was still blessed with hair. Um, and this was me just after I graduated. Um, and I graduated with a degree from uh, what's it called now? Back then it was called the University of Central England, it's now called Birmingham City University uh, with a degree in English language and literature. Um, I was highly skilled at Sonic the Hedgehog on graduation, um, but I hadn't really invested much time in, in what people told me I needed to do to get jobs like, you know, student journalism or student radio. I, I hadn't really done that. 
So when I went out to apply for jobs in journalism and radio, they said, have you invested time in student journalism and radio? And I kind of went, I didn't realise you had to. But um, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I tried a few office jobs. Um, the thing that I learned from that is that I didn't want to do office jobs. Um, and then I could actually remember the conversation. It was a lunch break. Um, and one uh, person said, oh, I'm doing a TEFL course. Now, I didn't know what TEFL was. Um, if you don't know this acronym, it's Teaching English as a Foreign Language. Um, and, and I kind of I said, well, what is that? And she went, well, it's, you know, I'm going to go abroad and teach. And this was kind of November in London. And I kind of looked out the window and looked at the weather and thought, right, OK, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go somewhere exciting and exotic. Um, so I did this course. I'll talk about the course in a minute. And I moved into the private language school sector. And I worked here from about 1993 to 2005. And I worked in Poland in a very sort of unpleasant industrial town in Poland called Botswadek and also an incredibly beautiful medieval town called Krakow in Poland. Um, I worked in Spain, just outside Barcelona, uh, in what is now North Macedonia, um, then was the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. I worked in Bosnia and I worked in Taiwan. Um, and these are all, as I say, private language schools. So, Teenagers come after school. Five, six, seven year olds come and they, they play and sing songs and run around and, and play games in English. Um, adults come, everything from, um, you know, absolute beginners all the way up to people who are pretty, pretty fluent, pretty good, um, who just want to maintain their language skills, maybe learn a bit more, maybe learn a few idioms. People sometimes want to prepare for exams, people sometimes want just to come because it's their hobby. They're, they've got no real purpose for learning, for learning English. They just like doing it. Um, these are generally small businesses. They're generally um, not, not big. There's, there's, you know, 10 to 20 people working there. There are some global chains. I don't know if you've got English First, Malaysia, International House. Um, these are kind of the global chains. But they're the exception um, and they're mostly franchises anyway. So they're actually small businesses. They're just paying for the name. Um, and this means that this means that a lot of things they, they're if they're a small business, they're running on um, quite tight profit margins. So they've got they're very careful about you know spending money. They can't be, you know, we're going to build a new building because they just don't have the money to do it. You find these places all over the world, absolutely all over the world. Um, possibly, I don't really know about Malaysia and these, these kind of places, but you go to Thailand, you go over the border, you know, a small town of 20,000 people could well have a private language school somewhere where the kids go, where the adults go. Um, I can tell you that in Europe, my first job in Spain was in a town of 3,000 people. 3,000 people, but it was enough to support um, a, a tiny little language school, which is where I worked. And when I say tiny little language school, it was actually just me um, and the boss was in, a, in, a, in another town. It's generally low stakes teaching. Now, by low stakes, I mean, it's not life changing. Your degrees um, are going to sort of determine in, in many ways how, how you, your career pans out. I mean, that's what we do then, right? Um, but this is not like that. This, this is, is low stakes. So the corollary of that is that the students are not stressed. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk in a, in a in a couple of minutes about working 
with high stakes students and there is a lot of stress involved. These private schools, it's um, it, it's low stakes, low stress. Generally, evening classes or post school classes for younger learners. And for me in my 20s, not having to work in the mornings was possibly the best thing. You know, I had friends going, you know, I'm going to be a, I'm going to join a law firm and I'm going to be a partner by um, by the time I'm 35. And I'm going to and I was going, I don't have to get up until 11 o'clock. Um, and for me, at the age of, of 25, that was um, that was good. Teaching was 20, 24 hours a week teaching. Now that is a heavy teaching load. That is a lot of teaching because the way we calculate things generally in the sort of the, the language teaching industry is, is one hour of teaching carries one hour of preparation. So, you know, teaching 24 hours is nominally a 48 hour week. Um, there's also some marking, but not a huge amount of marking. Because it's low stakes, the marking is all developmental. We're not doing formal assessment. We used to do kind of multiple choice tests and that kind of thing. But it was it was not a heavy marking load. And often you move somewhere and they provide you housing. Now, for me, at the age of 25, that was brilliant because I don't have to worry about renting landlords and contracts and rent and, and stuff housing's provided fantastic um and the last thing they were is generally quite a young staff it's the kind of career that, that people do quite a lot when they, when they're in the 20s and often move out of by the time they're 30. so so the people that you're working with are generally quite young so there's a lot of energy there there's a lot of there's a sense of fun there. There's a, a sense of creativity there. And it was really, really enjoyable. There was also, among my colleagues in these times, what I would like to describe as a healthy sprinkling of eccentrics. Um, now, these were, you know, all kinds of, of people. There were musicians trying to start a band in Poland because they, they tried to start a band in England, didn't work, so they, they tried to start a band in, in Poland. I knew people in Bosnia who had been in, the, um, in the, the, the sort of the charity sector, the emergency sector for, for the, the post-war reconstruction, and they liked it there. The reconstruction had kind of completed and they wanted to stay on. Um, you met, I met an ex, a guy who'd been a sailor for, 45 years and had actually been in a shipwreck. Um, and then he, he decided, I don't want to be a sailor anymore. And he was a, a, a teacher. So you meet all kinds of, of, of interesting people. But they're businesses, they're low profit margins. And when I say they provide the housing for you, you I think you can imagine what I mean. I, I mean, I, I lived in nicer places when I was a student. It's low pay. It's very low pay. Um, this one, my mother made me put that in. Um, it's low status. I mean, you say to people, you know, what do you do? I'm, I'm an English language teacher. I work in Poland. They go, ah, are you doing that for a year? I go, well, I don't know. Um, it's not. It's it's not a, a sort of socially high status job. This is a problem. Because quite often they're on nine month contracts, these places. So the, the, the language schools will run from September till June. And then they'll say, come back in September. And you go, well, what, what about three months? Um, now, there's work to do. There's work to be done. There's in, in the UK, at least pre Brexit in the UK, loads of European students will come over for, for six week language classes. Um, in 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 Oxford and Cambridge and these places, and there was tons and tons of work, but it was kind of unpredictable. So you're kind of working, and then you have to find another job for the summer, and then you come back. Um, so you get this thing called precarity. This this idea that your job is precarious. 
And because these are small businesses, small businesses are vulnerable to going out of business. Um, if they get it wrong and they're running on, on small margins, you might come back. And it never happened to me, but it happened to friends of mine. They came back after the summer and um, their school wasn't there anymore. It had, it had gone bankrupt in the summer. Um, what happened to me is that I, I was living in Skopje, North Macedonia. Um, I went home for the summer. I came back with a key for my new flat and I couldn't find the flat, um, which was a problem. But there you go. Um, and the last thing, if you're sitting here thinking, right, I'm going to get a job in the centre of Paris. Sorry, you're not. Um, you're not going to get, you're not going to walk straight into a job um, in overlooking the Rambler in Barcelona. Um, you're not going to walk straight into a job overlooking um, uh, the Spanish steps in Rome. You might get a job in the suburbs of Paris, you know, in the suburbs of Rome, but, but, but kind of these super, I'm, I'm sort of super visions of, of of life in another country. I mean, it's it's not like that. You're going to be working hard. You're going to be um, probably working in in somewhere not overly glamorous, but quite possibly a short train ride away from somewhere that is pretty cool. Um, and that that was that. For me, that lifestyle at the age of 25, 30 was brilliant. I took my teaching incredibly seriously. I was I was very committed to developing myself as a teacher. It was the rest of, of life that I didn't particularly want to take very seriously. Um, and, and that suited me quite well. Now, there are lots of qualifications you can do to get into this kind of work. The most common one and the, 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 the best one to look at if you're interested is called the CELTA, um, Certificate in English Language Teaching to Adults. Um, again, it's 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 worldwide. Um, I looked it up and I couldn't find one that's happening in Malaysia at the moment, uh, but there is one, you know, someone in London for £1,200. If you're going to do this, just a word of warning, the name CELTA is a recognised name. Careful course, it doesn't belong to anybody, so anybody could do it. I could you know, I, I could set up a, a TEFL course and give you a TEFL certificate. And when you go out job hunting, it would be meaningless. So just just a word of warning, make sure that you, that you choose the right course. OK. So I did this for six or seven years. And it was great. I really enjoyed it. Super creative teaching, super fun lifestyle. No money in my pocket, but it, I was enjoying life. Um, I was an experienced EFL teacher. I'd worked in various places and various contexts. But I was living contract to contract and I had a good knowledge of the, of the field, including CAL. <laughs> now, CAL is computer assisted language learning. And back in those days, that was a big sort of thing. Oh, you can use a computer. Yeah. Um, does it have an internet on it? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I was I was 30. It was a little bit older when that picture was taken, um, but 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 it was kind of my career. And I started doing a bit of teaching in the corporate sector. Companies. And I taught everywhere from um, HSBC in the World Trade Center on the 20th floor of the World Trade Center in Taipei. To. Uh, the National Water Association of Romania to to one single guy in a very expensive suit in Eastern Europe that I did not want to ask how he got his money. Um, generally, though, it was medium and large enterprises, medium and large companies. They were generally it was pretty well equipped teaching. But this was not guaranteed. OK, so there were, I mean, there was clearly there were there were companies where the HR department had hired an English teacher to come in and do the training, um, but they hadn't thought about where they would do it. So, I mean, I did I did one 
class, one course just in their office. So they were all sitting behind their desks and I was kind of standing at the front going the definite article, checking their emails. Um, so it can be very well equipped. Sometimes it isn't. It's usually through agencies or private language schools. If you want to work in the corporate sector, it's unusual that you would go and get hired by board to teach their people um, English. You, they would usually hire, they, they go to a, a, a local school or, or an agency um, to, to get a teacher. Um, and it wouldn't be a full time job. They wouldn't have 40 hours work for one teacher. They'd, they'd offer you know, six hours here. So, so the teacher is going to this company for six hours, this company for four hours, this company for 10 hours. Um, it's never something that I did um, full time. I was always combining it with the other teaching on, in, in the language schools. Um, and uh, it was also a bit odd in terms of stakes because the stakes were mixed. Sometimes it was the, the HR department had a bit of money left over at the end of the financial year, so they needed to spend it. So, right, let's do some English teaching, and nobody cared about it. Other times, promotion was based, was partially based on your on the tests that you gave at the end. So you know, you're teaching these guys and you know that you've been told that the best three in this class are going to be promoted. OK, so that's my choice to make. So that can be a bit, a bit odd. But you can have really, really weird classroom dynamics really weird, almost impossible classroom dynamics. Because if you've got, and you're doing the corporate training and you've got person, 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 boss. And you say, does anybody know the answer? And they all look at the boss. And the boss goes like that. They're not going to answer. They're not going to show up for the boss. You, you get, you know, office politics coming into um, coming into the classroom. So it can be great, but it can also be a bit weird. And especially if you've got this kind of high stakes thing or you've got to pass this course to to get your promotion or get your pay rise. It, it can be a, a, a strange, strange classroom dynamic. Also, you know, people are tired, people are at work. Um, or sometimes this is after work, so they've just done an eight hour day. And then you say, right, sit down. We're talking about the present perfect. You know, it's it's not easy. The precarity here is a big thing. Because you ask anybody that what gets cut in a recession, it's the training. The training budget is one of the first things to go if a company is struggling. Um, and it's not just a recession. Maybe, maybe they, they, as I say, they just had a, a bit of a bump in income, and then um, decided to spend it one year. Great, good for them. But it means that you can't rely on on these contracts lasting any length of time. It's generally highly competitive, and by highly competitive, I don't actually mean for the teachers. I mean for the different language schools. So you're going, I'm going to teach my class now. Hello, nice to meet you. Teach, teach, teach. And there's somebody from another language school pitching for the same business. Um, so again, it, 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 it's not stable. It's not stable work. Now, in a place like Bucharest in Romania, you've got so many companies that want this kind of training and relatively few English teachers qualified through this system, the system I've mentioned, that it, perhaps that doesn't matter so much because you, you jump from one contract to one contract to one contract to one contract, but it's not guaranteed and there's always that precarity there. Now this I found as, as a 30-year-old as a I had to buy a tie and I was um, 
very disappointed in that. You need a, a level of professional presentation. And you need a higher level of qualifications. OK, and, and the, the, the qualification is called the Delta. Um, you know, generally people teach with a CELTA, which is a pre-service qualification for two or three years and then move on to do the Delta. Um, you can do it 12 weeks full time. You can do it over a year part time and you can also do it online. And a lot of people will do this. Um, uh, while they're working. Personally, I took a, I took a break. I took a three month break to do it, to do it intensively. Um, but a lot of people will do it um, full time. More expensive. Now, if you've been teaching in Dubai. Three thousand pounds doable. If you've been teaching in. Thailand, perhaps rural Thailand. Well, Poland, when I did it, it can be quite a struggle to save that much money. So it's expensive. You need to be committed to it. So that was that that kind of was my, was the first 15 years of my career working in these private schools, teaching adults, going into companies for the, for the last part of it. As I said, very creative teaching, all kinds of you're doing role plays, you're doing simulations, you're, you're thinking about you hear a song on the radio and you go, I could use that to teach relative clauses. And your friends go, I'm not again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's. It's really, really enjoyable, fun teaching. And I come home every so often. Um, and this was about 2007. And my friends had, had suddenly, instead of being, you know, the fun crowd from the university, they had things like cars and mortgages and babies. And I was still in my career, I was still in this kind of contract, 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 not saving very much money at all. Um, the title of the talk kind of avoiding the responsibility. And I'd look around and I know I said at, at, at the, the beginning that, that <clears throat> most of the people were young who were working there. But you'd also find. You know, 60 year olds still doing it. And you kind of say to them, when are you going to retire? And the guy. They had no pension. And no savings. They were just doing it. And you didn't meet anybody sort of really up. You never met a bunch of 85 year olds still going into the classroom. But you did wonder what was going to happen to these people. And they just kind of got stuck in this low stakes, um, low pay teaching environment. I think it's a great environment. There's nothing wrong with it. But at about the age of 35, I decided that I didn't want to get stuck in it. Um, at this point, I, I regarded myself as, as very experienced. Um, without any pension or any savings. It have a motorbike. It was very nice. I was also looking for new challenges in life. Now, I've been doing this this same context for, for a long time. I was looking for something new. So. I went back to the UK. And I found myself a job. Um, <clears throat> at a strange little place called the University of Nottingham. Um, in the UK. Teaching uh, English for academic purposes. Now this is what selfie do upstairs downstairs. Well, well probably all, all over the place. Um, uh, in the, the department in Nottingham is called Sealy. I don't know why they prefer not to take pictures of themselves. Like that. Um, we, in the UK, we get pre COVID, we got in large, large numbers of overseas students needing language support coming to study at universities in the UK. And the biggest, the biggest single nationality 
is the mainland Chinese, but we would get people from the Middle East, we get people from um, South America, people from Africa. Sometimes they would need English language support, sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes there was a disagreement with the university about whether they needed it or not. Um, but it was it was a big, big thing. And it was new to me. First thing it was, was they gave me a contract and they said, and I said, well, how long is this contract for? And they went, it's a permanent contract. I went, what? Permanent? What does that mean? Well, you do it until you leave. Oh. <laughs> and we contribute to a pension scheme. Oh. Um, so, so if you get a contract, if you get a permanent contract, it can be quite well paid, relatively speaking. I mean, I'm not talking um I'm I'm not talking riches, but relatively speaking. On the flip side of that, it's high stakes. Because if you've got a student on a pre-sessional course, do you guys know what a pre-sessional is? It's a course that, that, that a lot of students will do in the summer before their main degree. So if their English language qualification like IELTS is a little bit less than they need, they will come and study in the summer and do an intensive English language course um, and then have to uh, and have to pass that before they move on to their main degree. And if you say to a student at the end of one of these pre-sessional courses, you have failed. That's life changing for them. You know, there's a there's a there's a kind of th thinking that, oh, these um, the students in, in studying in the UK are all rich and they don't care. And that's not true. Um, some of them are. But in my experience, most of them are, are kind of middle class. Their parents have saved a lot of a lot of years to send them. And then you're telling them, well, your essay writing isn't good enough. You have to go back. You know, it's very, very high stakes. I'm not saying that we shouldn't fail students on occasion, but at the same time, we've got to remember that this is life changing for some of them, and that's a big responsibility to take. on. You have good support systems, except when you don't. Um, so you've got a library, you've got um, Moodle or the equivalent of Moodle. You've got IT support. You've got a computer uh, when it works. Um, you've got you've probably got a desk. Um, so and these are things that you can't always rely on in uh, the private language school sector. Um, I, I mean, when I worked for a language teaching organisation that I won't go, I won't name here, except to say that it's it's a council and it's British. Um, they used to give you one computer per three students with three teachers. Right, so, you know, they, that's not how it works in the university generally. You get much better infrastructure. You generally need a master's degree. Um, I didn't have a master's degree when I joined Nottingham. And actually, I'm not quite sure how I manage this, but Nottingham paid for my master's degree. Um, and there was some kind of bureaucratic hiccup, and it was supposed to be that Nottingham would pay for two thirds of my master's degree. And it ended up that I got, they paid for four thirds of my master's degree. Um, I'm not sure, I really, to this day, I can't remember how that happened, but I had to give the other third back, which was disappointing. Um, but it, though, it's getting harder to get a job without a master's degree in the sector, especially a permanent job. I think, I think I was, I just sort of, just got in under the, um, under the, under the whatever you get in under, um, and it's getting harder and harder without a master's degree. There is much more focus on assessment. There is much more focus on assessment. Um, and in some ways, this is good. This is a challenge. This is a, uh, um, you know, it's it's 
you could really get to think about about what you expect from students and and instead of just teaching a textbook you actually go okay so what do we need the students to do and let's apply theories of, of learning for assessment and let's let's think about are we going to assess atomistically or holistically there's all kinds of interesting thought-provoking things to do but at the same time at the end of term you're still reading i've i've got 30 essays that i have to mark and i've got to write 200 words of feedback for each student um now, obviously, when you're undergraduates in the School of English, marking your work is an absolute joy, I have been told. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it doesn't always inspire you. Um, and there can be less motivation in students. You know, you're working in the evening classes with the, with the professionals. They're coming because they want to. They're coming to classes because they want to. They're paying for it. They're coming after work. They want to be there. They want to learn. Sometimes you get students coming from overseas. They think that their English is very good because they've got six and IELTS. And then the university says, hey, 6.5, 10 weeks studying in the summer. Um, and then even if they start, you know, they've been they've been studying in their home country for 10 years, intensive, 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 intensive. And then they come to start their new life and it's like more English. Um, so it can, the motivation among students can drop in, in, in UK courses. And you've got what I call this kind of the rainy February morning class where you know the teacher is tired and has got wet at the bus stop and the students are tired and got wet at the bus stop and nobody wants to be there and you know um that that can happen doesn't always happen Some, sometimes you get fantastic classes but it can be um less motivation and eap can be very dry to teach OK, today is the fourth lesson on the Harvard APA referencing style. Today we are going to look at how to write the date. Um, now, I, th I don't think that EAP needs to be dry. I really don't think EAP needs to be dry. Sometimes academic writing is dry by necessity. They've got complex ideas, but I don't think teaching about it needs to be dry. But some of the materials that, that you, you might be given as an EAP teacher can be very dry. And this is the thing that, that gets me excited. This is the thing that I really enjoy about it. It's not really the focus on, you know, noun phrases or subject verb agreement or that kind of stuff. It's the, it's the focus on study skills, expression of criticality and um, personal development. You know, and, and if, you see, if you say to a student, or if a student writes, uh, let me think, um, I was marking an essay this morning that used the word undoubtedly. And I kind of went, mm, no. Um, it, there, there is, he was writing about, what was he writing about? McDonald's. Um, McDonald's is undoubtedly one of the, the the biggest companies in the world. Um, and I can, that's not that doesn't quite belong there, does it? And then trying to trying to work out how to explain to the students what this is. Um, and you do get into some quite interesting linguistic areas. You get into things like meta discourse, and you get into things like nominalization stuff. Um, but but that to me is is the exciting bit about it. Of course, there's always a but. Um, within the university sector, especially for EAP, especially post COVID, precarity is growing. As I said, I walked into a permanent contract and where they paid for my master's degree. That is becoming less and less common. Um, the universities, if I can be slightly cynical, well, not slightly cynical, slightly. Um, I don't know what it is, but the universities seem to be transferring 
the risk of student numbers, of low student numbers, from themselves onto their staff, at least in the UK. So they go, oh, we, I don't know if we can offer you a, a contract in more than six months. But I've got to pay my mortgage. But oh, we don't know what the students are going to be like. It could be in six months. Um, and it, it's that kind of thing is growing. Um, it's growing especially because of the growing privatisation of EAP in the UK. There are these big companies that are just going onto campuses and saying, we can do it cheaper, we can do it better. The universities go, well, they kind of hear we can do it cheaper and they say they said they can do it better, so we're going to do it. Um, and these guys are, are, are can be quite ruthless with staff. So it does, it's not every university, but it but it's it's a thing. So precarity is growing. Within the university, EAP does have relatively low academic status. It doesn't have to be like this, but most EAP teachers, I don't have a PhD. Um, most EAP teachers don't have a PhD. So when and a PhD is research training. And if you don't have the PhD, you're not trained in that way of doing research and publication. And, and that's a big sort of status thing. Um, so a lot of EAP people feel they're kind of marginalized within, within the university. Within EAP, you generally have year round teaching um, because you have these summer classes and because you're not expected to be doing research. So it can be, you know, year round. Uh, a friend of mine who used to work here he used to call it the golden treadmill. He just keeps on going. University work can be bureaucratic. Um, it can be impersonal. Um, you know, you big big organisations, universities have processes, and you have to follow processes. You know, if I was working back in 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 Poland and um, a student missed the test because he was ill and he still wanted to go up the level and I knew as a teacher that he was good enough to go up the level. I could go to my boss and say, don't worry, you missed the test. It's fine. He was sick. I trust him. He's good enough. Fine. He goes up the level. It doesn't happen like that at universities. You have to do extenuated circumstances, medical circumstances. And it's systems based. Um, and some people do find this quite, quite frustrating when they make that move. When they make the move from working in a small private language school with 10 people to a university with 3,000 members of staff, it's, it's difficult to adjust. Okay. Now, EAP is not something that people would do forever, quite often. Um, something that I'm probably going to do till, till I retire. Uh, but quite often people would use EAP and language teaching as a way out. Um, some people will teach English for a while in the, in the sort of system I've described, then get a PhD and become an academic and work in applied linguistics, pure linguistics, education studies, sometimes translation studies. I've even got a friend who I knew in Poland, who the whole reason that she went to Poland was to learn Polish. Um, and she is now on the UK Nottingham campus as a assistant or associate professor in sociology on women and her speciality is women's rights in Poland. So, you know, they're, they're, there's, there's, there's roots into academia, but generally it would be those three. Some people go into corporate training full time. There's a company in Central KL called Mango that I used to know. Uh, they still exist and they're doing well. And they were EAP teachers, or sorry, EFL teachers at the British Council doing that kind of going to the company thing. They set up their own company and they're doing well. Some people move into publishing. 
they get um, it's very difficult to work in educational publishing if you don't have experience of education. So they get the experience of education, educational publishing, and then wider publishing groups. Some people will become an assessment specialist. Um, have you heard of IELTS? IELTS is a global, massive organisation. Um, they test, God knows how many people they test every year. There's a huge amount of um, administration, test development. They've got, they've got to write these tests. Um, they've got to, to pilot these tests. They've got to analyse the results. So there's all kinds of work in assessment specialists. And IELTS is only one. <laughs> And a whole bunch of global language tests. Some people would move into uh, secondary education, so they would go and they do a couple of years teaching English, and then they're right. I'm enjoying this teaching. I'm going to go and get um, a, a, a teaching certificate that will allow me to, to teach in um, in a secondary school or a primary school. Uh, a friend of mine lives in Australia. I used to work with him in Romania. Um, he is the happiest man in the world, um, partly because he married a Malaysian and partly because he teaches in a primary school. He just he loves his life. Or if you're particularly um, misguided, you can do what I did and go into EAP management um, and beyond. The um, there's a there's one of the most senior people in the University of Kent. So, you know, the, the, the upper management team, the senior management team is X EAP. Um, there's a couple of other people that, that are, are, are getting there. Um, and anything else where you think you can leverage your experience. Um, you can basically any anything else where. Uh, you can you'd say, you know, OK, there's a job in. Uh, hospitality, you can say, look, I've lived abroad, I've, I've, I've dealt with with different cultures and, and you, if you if you're if you're good at, at selling this experience, it's very, very adaptable. Overall. If you take the teaching seriously. You invest time and effort into becoming a really good EFL teacher. It's extremely enjoyable teaching and it's extremely creative teaching. If you could, if you could, if I if I could repeat any any year from the last God knows years of my career, it would be those 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 early years where it was low stakes, it was fun, it was creative. You get a chance to live in places that might never have occurred to you. You know, I said you're not going to live in, in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. I ended up living in a country I had never heard of. Um, which is now North Macedonia. I hadn't heard of it, didn't know it existed. I had Yugoslavia and then there were things and problems and stuff. Um, and I ended up living there and it was one of the best years of my life. Fantastic place. A lot of people when they graduate, when they graduate, they end up in those kind of office jobs where they're photocopying and making the tea and, you know, go to Starbucks and stuff. Um, and also you, you don't get much autonomy in, in, in part in often in, in corporate jobs at the beginning of your career. Um, teaching EFL, teaching English as foreign language, you're given a lot of professional autonomy from the very start. Now, you might have lesson observations once a term, but you're generally working unsupervised. Um, and that's, that's, a, a, that's a big deal, I think. And I said the salary's, the salary's rubbish, um, but locally speaking, it can be quite good. You know, the, the people I used to work with in China, now this is a mid-career thing, not an early career thing. They were, the salaries that the foreign teachers got um, in China 
was something like a bank manager, I was told. So these guys were, well, I mean, some of them were quite old, but, but you could, could get this job at the age of 25, 30. And you're, you're, you're living with the, the equivalent salary of a relatively senior person. When I lived in Krakow in Poland, um, I think I cooked twice in a year because I could afford to eat out all the time. Um, couldn't do that in England. So you're not going to save money for your pension, but you get a reasonable standard of living um, uh, locally speaking. And there's a lot of soft skills, a lot of soft skills that you can learn from it. You can learn languages, you can you can learn intercultural awareness, you can learn adaptability and, fle and flexibility, and you can put all that on your CV. OK, um, we're running out of time. So I was going to do a quick discussion about what makes a good language teacher, but we're not going to do a quick discussion about what makes a good language teacher, because one of the things that makes a good language teacher is knowing how to do the timing of a class. Um, I would say that one of the, the key things about an effective language teacher is not just knowing your subject. It's not just being able to talk about language, talk about grammar, to talk about collocation. It's balancing explanation, engagement, and crucially activation. In a good language class, the students are talking more than you are. They're using what you learn. Now, occasionally, I will I will come across people who, who treat teaching as an art. I'll go, I just go in there and I, I do my thing and, and I, I don't know, they just learn. It's not what happens, in my view. It's a skill. And like any skill, from playing football to playing the guitar to whatever, you can always get better at it. And it's, it's the kind of job where you're always, where a good person is always reflecting, thinking, thinking, how can I do this better? How can I improve my skills? Now, at the beginning of your career, maybe your, your skills will improve like that. Towards the end of your career, um, they might slow down. When you get into management, it, it does that. But the point is that it's, it's, it's something that you, you work at, that you work at getting good at. It takes work, dedication, and reflection. Just that. Language I want to teach you. When people, I've had people come and, and, and say this at an interview. I'm passionate about teaching students essays. Are you? Um, I love my students. I just love my. You don't love your students on a rainy Thursday morning in February. Um, What I'm looking for when I'm hiring people is not people who are passionate about English or who love their students. It's about I create the opportunities for my students to do the best they can. And there's a subtle difference there. I work hard to enable my students to learn. Um, and that, in my view, is what makes a good, a good language teacher. OK. Um, I gave I wanted to have a task, but we've run out of time. Um, there is further reading on this slide. Is there a way to distribute this slide? Because I haven't. Yes. Yeah. We can upload it. OK, brilliant. Um, oh, just everybody takes a picture. Um, OK, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Anything that's unclear? Yes. Um, I have a few questions if anybody wants to ask and running out of time, please interrupt me. Um, I was looking at doing CELTA for some actually, um, but I do have a bunch of friends that have done it. And the employability after doing CELTA takes about four months to get in, I guess. A um, bunch of them did it online, a bunch of them did it in person. And I don't know which will be more recommended for this time. Do you think there's a difference? Do you think it matters if you're doing it online? Okay, so at that stage of my career, online didn't exist. Um, 
So one one of the reasons that the CELTA is such a well recognized qualification is that it includes teaching practice. It includes supervised teaching practice. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know how that works if you if you're studying online. Um, but that as a as a potential employer, um, you know, the word the word CELTA unlocks doors. Um, I, I think I, I don't know how much of a difference it would make. I mean, if you if you're really interested, write to International House, go to International House website and say, you know, explain your situation. Um, and these are the people that recruit and say, you know, what would you what would you suggest? Because they they want good staff and they want staff with the kind of qualifications that they want, and they will will answer emails. Delta, does that come with a little bit more stability if you just work with yourself? It doesn't come with stability. It opens doors to jobs that can have more stability. But sometimes it opens doors to jobs, as like I was saying, in the in the corporate, doing corporate training, which in many ways are less stable. Um, other, it might. It, I never tried to do this, but it it might. It would certainly open doors into the British Council, um, and they. Um, they're unlikely to go out of business, um, at least not yet. I mean, give it. Up. Um, if we have another year of politics like we've had this year, it might happen. Um, but yeah, Delta gets you things like the British Council, which yeah would give you more stability, would give you a slightly higher higher pay. It also makes you a much better teacher. Um, I learned much more about what happens in the classroom um, doing my Delta than I did doing my Masters. Um, I enjoyed it. Any else? Okay. Any other questions? Just also check if any, yes, there are any questions. <laughs> okay. If anybody has questions, even on MS Teams, you can either um unmute yourselves and ask the question or type it into uh the chat box i just want one of the related question but i think i read the title of your speech and basically i think the title was kind of like how i didn't work gave me a job so i think like that yeah but basically, from my, my perspective, you're kind of very hard for interesting. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. Um, and this is what I was saying about spinning your experience to try and. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the point of the title, um, very much inspired by my mother's view of my career, <laughs> is um, the for the first few years, that kind of job does you know you, you don't have to 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 take part in things like oh i've got to get the deposit together to rent a flat and then i've got to pay my electricity bills because you, you in my experience anyway i moved to a country in eastern europe that nobody had heard of and they gave me a flat and they paid the bills and and all of that kind of stuff was was taken care of um and so that's what I meant by kind of avoiding responsibility. Um, and I think, you know, quite a few people will take a gap year between school and university. I've heard of people saying, well, I'm taking a gap year after university. I'm, I'm going to finish my university. I'm going to have a year of doing things, personal enrichment things, and then I'm going to jump into my career. Um, I kind of saw it a little bit like that. It was kind of, I'm going to do this this 
teaching English thing for a year or two or three, and then I'm going to find something else to do. Um, and what my experience was, was A, I really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed the teaching and I found that I really enjoyed developing the skill of teaching as much as I did actually t teaching, you know, going talking about it with friends and, and thinking of creative ideas and that kind of thing. And that's when it started to turn into a career. But, you know, a, a lawyer would probably have a career plan. Um, academics generally have a, a career plan. Um, I didn't, and that's kind of where the, the, the title came from. Thank you for such a difference in the talk. I'm very much interested in the Chinese culture in China. I don't know that it's actually teaching China. So, I mean, there's all restrictions, you know, in, in China. So, how's the teaching in China? Uh, well, how's the teaching? Okay, so there's, I'm going to say, I'm going to sound a little bit sort of pretentious. There's two Chinas. Um, there's China without COVID and there's China with COVID. Um, I only experienced China with COVID and it was extremely challenging um, because, you know, the, they, they just go, right, I, we'd get a message. on. We got a message about a month ago on Monday at 12 o'clock that teaching is moving online from Monday at nine o'clock. Things just change really quickly. Term dates, you know, two weeks gets taken off the term or the term gets gets moved into the holidays. Things just change. And it's not the university's fault. It's it's this, uh, the government has this this, this, this plan and they, they get cases and they don't want an outbreak, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of teaching in China, the students are absolutely fantastic students. I mean, I know that I was working at a, a prestigious university, so so the students who got there were successful high school students, but they 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 were engaged and hardworking and um, just just really really good to teach. I mean, not every single one. You got the odd you know, wake up, um, but they they were generally really really nice students to to teach and with good levels of English as well. Um, I don't think I taught anybody with lower than maybe a 5.5 IELTS, kind of B, B1 level. Um, living in China as a foreigner um, was uh, challenging in some ways. I mean, my Chinese, my Chinese, I, when I, I went knowing the numbers one to three, and that was about it. I now know the numbers one to five, but I confuse four and five. Um, people were so nice and friendly and, and on, you know, in shops on the street. They kind of, if you walk into a shop, like you could see that, oh God, it's a foreigner. I'm a little bit foreign. No. Um, but, you know, you hear the thing, do, do, do the interaction and, and, and people were, were just very, 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 very kind, really, even to, to foreigners who didn't speak a word of their language. And, and that's not something you get everywhere. Um, how would teaching in China be without the COVID thing? Uh, still a challenge. I think work, I think universities have a somewhat different value system to the one that I'm used to. They, they value different things. Um, but yeah. So it's a, bit, it's a very difficult question. I, I can only scratch the surface of the answer. Okay, well, that's five minutes past our scheduled time. Thank you very much for listening. That so since there are no other questions, that concludes this talk. 
Sorry? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we were doing some kind of traditional. <laughs> So, so very people on Teams, I've just realised that the camera has been pointing that one. Uh, so. Yes. Sorry. I figured you were oh. probably like, well, that, that's what I was telling you, that it's oh, that sorry. way. Oh, do you have a question? No. OK. Just wanted to. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> yes. The stock will be available. You'll be able to access it again on, on the on Teams, and later on it will be uploaded onto the UNMC English uh, YouTube channel, so you can share it with other people then.